In this video, we'll be covering our first species within the Clostridia genus, Clostridium tetany, the cause of tetanus. And the title of this illustration is Rhesus Research Revolution, a little tongue twister that may make more sense after this segment. First, let's draw the scene. It's going to take place in a research lab, where people are doing experiments on rhesus monkeys. Notice all of the violet hues? Well, they're not actually even there. It must be your subconscious telling you that the Clostridia genus is gram-positive. Man, your subconscious is smart. Let's draw our first researcher. You'll notice he's quite suited up. Of course, this is to protect him from the many diseases that they've given to their test monkeys, but it also has a particular meaning as well. The Clostridia are obligate anaerobes, meaning they cannot survive in the presence of oxygen. This gas mask this guy's wearing will be our symbol for obligate anaerobe, and we'll continue to use it in future drawings. All of the bacteria in the Clostridia genus are also spore formers, so spore forming and anaerobes. To remember the spore forming, we're going to draw the same spore symbol as we've used in the bacillus story, so we'll give the monkeys some walnuts to munch on. Walnuts for spores. Like most spore formers, Clostridium tetany is often found in soil, but in order for tetany to cause infection, it needs to get under the skin and into an anaerobic environment. So ideally, it would be inside of a puncture wound that has been closed off to air. So the classic association are puncture wounds caused by rusty nails or barbed wire. We have already drawn the barbed wire around the lab cage. Now we'll draw pots of soil and rusty nails on the ground to help you remember the reservoir and transmission of Clostridium tetany. So just be on the lookout if a construction worker or a child playing near a construction zone begins to develop neuromuscular symptoms. And now we'll talk more about these symptoms. Tetanus causes a spastic paralysis in which patients experience relentless muscle contractions leading to rigidity. This is in contrast to the flaccid paralysis you'll see with botulism. A common manifestation of tetanus infection is called rhesus sardonicus. Rhesus meaning to grin and sardonicus, which is evil or malevolent, so an evil smile. And we've made our monkeys rhesus monkeys to remind you of the word rhesus. But we'll also draw a monkey grinning with his evil, mocking grin to show you the characteristic symptom. This often accompanies the well-known symptom of lockjaw, in which tense masseters prevent the jaw from opening. Tetanus can also present as opis thotinos, which is a characteristic extension and arching of the back due to powerful spasms of the back muscles. To help you remember this, we'll draw a monkey in this exaggerated position. Notice his arching back. So these are the two classic symptoms of Clostridia tetany, and they're very obvious. You're not going to really see them in any other illness. So distinguishing tetanus from history and presentation should not be a hard thing to do. And we know that test writers don't like giving away free points, so they'll probably test you on something slightly more challenging, like the pathogenesis of tetanus and its toxin. So let's dive into the mechanism of the pathogenesis and toxin. Let's start from the beginning. After a puncture wound occurs with a foreign object that has tetany spores on it, the spores are embedded in the flesh and the organism vegetates and stays at the wound site. It then produces and releases tetanus toxin, also known as tetanospasmin, and it's the toxin, not the bacteria, that causes all of the symptoms. Tetanus toxin travels retrograde through the motor axons to the spinal cord. You shouldn't have to remember the word retrograde because it just makes sense. It's traveling through motor neurons from the periphery to the spinal cord. But anterograde for motor neurons would be from the spinal cord to the periphery. So since it's the opposite direction, it must be retrograde. But even so, we'll still help you remember retrograde by drawing this monkey operating a pulley. And on the pulley are scissors, which represent the toxin. And you'll see why in a second. But if anterograde is the direction in which the monkey's pulling the pulley, the scissors are traveling back in the opposite direction, or retrograde. So now why are we representing the toxin as scissors? Well, it's because tetanus toxin acts as a protease. It cleaves a protein called snare. By cleaving the snare protein, it inhibits exocytosis of the neurotransmitter into the synapse. So to represent this, we're gonna draw a snare trap to represent snare protein and have the monkey cutting the rope, a protease action. And you'll also notice on the guy's suit, it now says G and G labs. Well, this is meant to represent two types of inhibitory neurons, GABA and glycine. And by trapping him in this snare, it shows that the tetanus works to inhibit GABA and glycine. And logically, this makes sense. If GABA and glycine normally work to inhibit motor neurons, their activation would cause flaccid or relaxed muscles. If we inhibit the inhibitors, then the result is uncontrolled firing of the neurons leading to spasm. 
So GNG is for GABA and glycine. Now there is one more aspect of these interneurons you need to know. They have a slightly special name. They're called Renshaw cells. Their job is to sense if there's overactivity of nearby motor neurons, and when they sense this overactivation, or tetanus, they fire and inhibit the overactive neuron. So just so that you can recognize the name Renshaw and make a connection with tetany, we'll illustrate it in this drawing. We're going to draw a monkey here with a wrench and a saw. Wrench and saw for Renshaw. We know we don't usually spell out words for you like this. We generally like to use more intuitive symbols, but this is one of the rare times we're going to just because it fits the story well. So one more time, just to drill this concept in. So look at this GNG researcher tied up on the right side over here. And picture GABA and glycine tied up in their vesicles, unable to be released because of the cleavage of the snare inside the axons of the inhibitory interneurons called Renshaw cells. This should really help you get any pathogenesis question right. Finally, we also need to know a little bit about the tetanus vaccine. The vaccine is a toxoid vaccine which means it's a toxin conjugated to a protein to increase immunogenicity. This produces an antibody response to the toxin, not to the organism. To help you remember that it's a toxoid vaccine, we're going to put a syringe in the hand of our researcher, and you'll notice we've colored it orange, just like the toxin scissors, which are also orange. And we've also placed it very close to the toxin symbols so that altogether you remember it's a toxoid vaccine. And that's all for Clostridium tetany. I'm starting to think we could just sell this illustration to PETA. They could throw it on a shirt. The rhesus research revolution has a nice ring to it.